I don't really, I don't have legal guardianship of him, but for the next 48 hours, he's with me. So, um, <laughs> and, and, and we're going to go full, buck full crazy. We're going crazy. DJs aren't supposed to pass out, but when they come to one of my parties, this is what happens to him. I put him to sleep. Next day, right? Yeah, put the drink on his head. I mean, you try to get in contact with me, you know, through all my, you know, biz, you know, partners and whatnot. Mm -hmm. But you, you never really got my number, so. Right, okay. My number? Yeah, yeah, I'm gonna, I'm yeah, gonna yeah. I'm going to tell you my number. Yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah, yeah. It's 555. Five, five. Yes. Okay. 555. Five, five, five. And then, you know, we have the top two floors of the hotel. Mm -hmm. we'll... And then it will carry on there. Yeah, yeah. Mm -hmm. <laughs> then it, mm -hmm. I mean, um, the, the after party. Mm -hmm. No, I know about them. And you got to tell him no. Oh, you Lord. got to tell him no. Oh. I, I did. Oh. I did. Oh. See, I got the receipts for everything I'm telling you. That's why I can yeah, say them yeah, so I need, freely. Can, 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 can I need, can I need. Gotta keep them there. Right. You need, you need locks on the doors. Mm -hmm. <laughs> okay, this is sounding kind of dangerous now. Like, you could tell that she was afraid of him. The allegations made against John P. Diddy Combs are nothing short of shocking, depraved, and incredibly disturbing. These allegations have rattled the entertainment industry and the world alike. But when I started looking into this case and into this entire situation, I couldn't help but consider that this had to be behavior that escalated from a young age. How did one man suddenly scare off an entire industry and get away with these depraved acts for so many years? Because you're going to find out today that he's been at this since he was a college student. Today, we are going to do a comprehensive, intense deep dive all about Diddy, his upbringing, where he got started, how he grew into a massive mogul, and all of the allegations and the lawsuits that he has been involved in throughout the years. So take care of yourselves today because this is going to be jam-packed full of possibly new information and it might be very, very disturbing. So sit back, relax, and take a deep breath. It's time to let the fresh air in. everyone. Welcome back or welcome if you're new. My name is Erin and I am fascinated by all things cults, true crime, and unique spiritual practices. I post a couple of videos on one of these topics every single week. So if you like that sort of thing, please consider subscribing to the channel. I would absolutely love to have you here. We're going to get right into today's video. So we're going to go all the way back to 1969 in Harlem, New York. This is when Diddy, P. Diddy, Sean Combs, the subject of today's video, was born. And what I found super interesting when I was starting this deep dive is that it seems that P. Diddy was kind of like adjacent to sketchy activity beginning at a very young age. His father was involved with Frank Lucas, who was a notorious drug. Lord. So when Diddy was just two years old, his father was actually shot dead while sitting in his car, allegedly by this person or one of his, you know, cronies. He was then raised by his single mother, who was a teacher's assistant and a model. And by all accounts, he grew up very, very impoverished. We hear a lot of talks of nepotism in the entertainment industry. And since Diddy's been around for so long and seems to know literally everybody in the entertainment space, whether they're musicians or actors or politicians or businessmen, I mean, he's almost like the entertainment industry's Jeff Epstein or Keith Raniere. He just seems to have his like tentacles in everyone. And they all are also very powerful people. Surprisingly, or maybe not so surprisingly, depending on how you feel, as he was growing up, he attended a Catholic school and then he even played football. 
And this is actually how he got his nickname, Puff, because apparently when he was angry, he would, quote, huff and puff, unquote. And if that isn't kind of like the perfect label for someone, I just imagine him getting angry all the time and using his anger as a means to intimidate people. It's definitely now making a lot more sense why this has been the nickname that stuck. So he was also a college dropout from Howard University. Apparently, he went to school for a couple of years and then decided, nope, I have other better opportunities. But even while he was attending university, he was known for throwing elaborate, huge parties. I mean, apparently these parties would attract thousands of people to them. I mean, I was not really a party girl in college. The house parties I did go to, they never got to be more than like 60, 70 people. I can't imagine being at a college party that had thousands of people at it. But he dropped out. And when he was 21 in 1990, he started interning at Uptown Records and would end up becoming a talent director for that label. He even helped to develop the careers of artists like Mary J. Blige. But just a few years later, he's like, nope, I can do this on my own, which, you know what, you gotta hand it to him. At this point, he's what, 23, 24? And he decides that he's going to start his own label and bring people from Uptown Records over to his brand new label. I mean, can you imagine making that kind of boss move when you're 23 years old? I'm trying to paint a picture for everybody about how this man got to the clout that he got, the success that he got, and why people are seemingly so afraid of him. So in 1993, he begins Bad Boy Records, and he actually took the Notorious B.I.G. from Uptown over to Bad Boy Records. And look, I am not pretending to know a lot about the history and impact of hip-hop in the 90s, and I am aware that B.I.G. and Tupac were friends initially, but then they kind of had some kind of falling out But I'm going to go through the whole B.I.G. Tupac scandal that occurred in the mid-90s. To my understanding, Bad Boy Records was marketed as the rival rap recording label to the already established West Coast's Death Row Records. And so this was causing like a massive conflict within the rap community. There were people deciding which coast was better than the other. There were insults flying left and right. I mean, the only thing I can like equate it to to make it somewhat similar in case you're not familiar with what was going on in the 90s between the two coasts is kind of like the Drake versus Kendrick controversy right now. And I feel like it's almost talking about politics, like sharing who I'm like on board with, but I'm a Kendrick girly all the way. (laughs) He's incredible. Sorry, Drake. But anyways, I digress. So there's this massive East Coast versus West Coast rap controversy and arguing, right? And it's happening on the main stage. It's happening in songs. It's happening in disses at like very public events. And this act of Diddy opening up this East Coast rap label, it sparked a ton of very tragic events in the mid 90s, all of which seem to have some weird connection with Diddy. and. This is very fishy, and it kind of makes you understand more why so many people seem to be kind of fearful of Diddy and don't want to speak out publicly. Because what we're seeing a lot of people share now is they were aware what was going on, but didn't know all of the details, or they knew something weird was going on and decided to just stay away from it. And who knows how many people will come out and share more details about the current allegations, but we're going to get into that a little bit later. Death Row Records had been on the scene since 91, and Bad Boy Records get started in New York in 93. So the East-West feud has been sparked with B.I.G. and Tupac at the forefront. In 1994, Tupac was shot in New York City. Upon walking into a recording studio, Tupac was shot at, and since he was just going to that studio to, like, feature on a song and he felt kind of 
wary about going in the first place, he felt like it was a setup. And he ended up publicly blaming B.I.G. and even mentioned that he saw Diddy there. So in retaliation to that accusation, and remember, Diddy's in his 20s. Like, I can't imagine getting on a full scale public battle with somebody in my 20s like this. Not even now. (laughs) But in retaliation to that accusation, Diddy and B.I.G. released the song Who Shot Ya? And it's very clear that Tupac took that personally. And I think he should have, to be honest. So the head of Death Row Records allegedly ends up publicly dissing Diddy and Bad Boy Records at this like award show. And then they immediately signed Tupac to their label later that year. So in response to B.I.G.'s Who Shot Ya, Tupac releases Hit Em Up. And this was kind of, I mean, I could be wrong, correct me if I'm wrong, but this track wasn't like immediately released on the album. It was kind of like a B-side. So it was kind of like flying under the radar until you started hearing the lyrics and the lyrics directly mention Bad Boy Records, B.I.G., and alludes to Diddy. So this feud is public and there are already threats of violence and both Tupac and Diddy and B.I.G. all have criminal records. They have both been in and out of jail multiple times. And during this time, which we'll get into very soon, Diddy is engaging in some questionable activities of his own. So in 1996, Diddy and B.I.G. release a song called Long Kiss Goodnight. And this song caused a lot of speculation because later that same year, Tupac would be shot and killed in Las Vegas. So people were kind of putting two and two together. B.I.G. and Tupac have this rivalry. There has been violence between the two of them. And so then in response to Tupac, B.I.G. and Diddy produced this song that alludes to the end of Tupac. So people were blaming not just B.I.G., but Diddy, trying to claim that he had, like, maybe not himself shot Tupac, but at least hired a hitman to do it. But of course, Diddy denies any and all involvement in Tupac's death. And even when people did try to bring this up again in an investigation later, I'm talking as recently as the last few years. It was discovered that the documentation that was meant to prove that Diddy was somehow involved was actually fabricated. And somebody else was actually accused of killing Tupac back in 2023. But now, despite all of that, with the current allegations Diddy is facing, people are speculating once again that he was somehow involved in Tupac's death. So at this point, Diddy is in his mid-20s, and he already has a ton of notoriety. He has a lot of money and a lot of power. He's become an intimidating force within the industry. He's sculpting the careers of hip-hop artists from people like Mariah Carey, Boys to Men, and of course, Usher. Usher was just 13 years old in 1994 when he lived with Diddy for a year, and he would go on to claim that, indeed, he saw some questionable things when he was living with Diddy. Puffy's place was, like, just filled with chicks and, like, nonstop, right? No, nah, not really. I Come mean, on. but, did I, hey, it was curious. I got a chance to see some things. Yeah, but you were 13. What were you I seeing? I went there to see the lifestyle. Right. And, and I saw it. And it was, and it was, <laughs> but I don't know if I could indulge and understand what I was even looking at. Now, Diddy was Usher's mentor of sorts. And Usher has been pretty vocal recently with sharing some anecdotes about his time with Diddy, but he didn't offer any specifics, most likely because he was fearful of the implications that could arise from him sharing any information. But also, And this is what's kind of happening allegedly with Justin Bieber being silent as well, is looking back at your adolescent life, recognizing you were underage and recognizing you were being exposed to things that most children should not be exposed to. It can elicit a feeling of incredible discomfort, trauma. I mean, it is a trauma. And... Usher even said that he didn't think that what he saw behind some of those closed doors at the Diddy parties, he expressed that 
as such a young person, he wouldn't have really understood what was going on. That's why he keeps explaining them away as being very curious. And I find it really odd that a grown man wants to mentor a child like this. Because it wouldn't be his first. Later, he would also mentor a teenage Justin Bieber who was scouted out by Usher. So it really does kind of implicate Usher, but we have to remember that he was also experiencing undue influence. But we would later find out, and there have been some disturbing videos associated with this claim, that when Diddy was starting to mentor Justin Bieber. He had Justin stay with him for like 48 hours straight, which just seems like really questionable. He was just trying to show him the lifestyle. He's in, you ever seen the movie 48 Hours? Right now, he's having 48 hours with Diddy, him and his boy. Um, they're having the times of their lives, like, 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 you know, where we hanging out and what we doing. Um, we, we can't really disclose, but, um, it's definitely a 15-year-old's dream. Same with Usher. And I can only imagine what these two boys saw or endured. And we will probably learn a lot more in the future. But for now, I'm just going to share. Yeah, I agree that it's it's very uncomfortable, especially considering that there has now been a resurfaced video where Bieber admits that he gave Diddy a fake number because Diddy was complaining that they didn't hang out too much anymore. And Justin was like, well, it's because I gave you a fake number. So in the same year, in 1994, he begins a relationship with Kimberly Porter, who he would be on and off with all the way until 2007 and have multiple children with. Now, Kimberly Porter has been back in headlines this week. Unfortunately, she passed away several years ago due to pneumonia, which people are now alleging seems a little fishy because she was only in her late 40s when she passed. But allegedly, she wrote a memoir that exposes a lot of the things that Diddy was doing during their time together. But recently, those allegations have been debunked by Diddy's children. They claimed that their mother never wrote a memoir and this 60-page book has to be a fake. So take with that what you will. So by the late 90s, his empire is growing. I mean, he is accumulating so much wealth, so much power, and a reputation within the entertainment industry that he is a party boy. He loves parties, He even says in interviews that he wants to turn up the heat at his parties because, you know, he wants people to be hot and sweaty. He wants the alcohol and most likely other substances to hit everybody at the right time. It's a little kinky, but yeah, yeah. rock with me, but just check it out. You need um, a lot of heat. A lot of heat. Heat. You mean that physically the place has to be hot? You don't have no air conditioning. No air conditioning. Why is that? Heat affects the alcohol, and it also affects, like, um, you know, everybody gets a little bit more comfortable and loose. Builds up a nice nice little sweat. And he is becoming a staple in the entertainment industry itself. He has not just, like, cultivating other people's careers, but he even starts dropping his own albums, and he gains success being, like, the main artist in an album. He was behind the scenes, and now he is at the forefront. And then in 1998, he starts Sean John Clothing. So he's got his music background. He's a producer. He's a talent developer. And now he has a clothing brand that would also expand to men's fragrances as well. And he just keeps accumulating business after business, even going so far as getting involved in the restaurant industry. But with all of these businesses, And with his name getting out there and people learning who he is, it's followed by lawsuit after lawsuit. And all of this gave him quite the reputation. So on April 15th, 1999, I guess he sees this music video on MTV. It's Nas's Hate Me Now. And it actually features him being crucified. And this makes Diddy pissed. He is incensed. He is angry. And he like storms into Nas's former manager's office and attacks him. And so this guy, Steve Stout, sues Combs in June of 1999. And Combs pleads guilty to harassment and was sentenced to do one day in an anger management class. One day in an anger management class. 
after going and attacking somebody when allegedly he was involved in a feud in the 90s that got someone killed. But he just like, oh, I got to go to anger management today. Bye, babe. Like, cancel the freak off tonight. I got to go to anger management because I attacked somebody. But I think that's the thing is that's why people became so afraid of him later in life and are still so afraid to speak out because he has connections everywhere and he was never afraid to start a fight. He was never afraid to be violent. He had so much money, so much power, so many supporters and a lot of collateral on other people. So it's it's operating just like a cult where he is able to control the behavior of everybody. He's able to manipulate and control the information that sneaks out into the public eye because he has so much clout. He has so much involvement in the industry. He is a leader in the entertainment industry, and he has spread his conglomerate of businesses into multiple other industries. So you can see the bite model of Stephen Hassan's like proof of a cult starting to seep in here. He's controlling the behavior. He's controlling the information. He is in turn being able to control the thoughts that people have around what he's doing because it's just for entertainment and you can't touch Diddy. You can't touch him. He's also a very manipulative person. We've seen the evidence of that. He is able to talk his way out of everything. And this leads me to the E in emotional control of the bite model. People weren't allowed to express how they felt to him because he would easily attack you or hold your career over your head or threaten to show the secret tapes that he'd taken of you at these freak-offs. But once again, we'll get to those freak-offs very shortly. So in December of 1999, after he's taken his anger management class, he's dating Jennifer Lopez and they're at a club when somehow a fight breaks out and allegedly... Diddy was like very provoked by somebody and like literal gunfire erupted and Combs ended up being charged with weapon related charges, including trying to claim that his like security guard was the one with the gun. But this case ended up being settled secretly and JLo left him shortly after that. And while we jump in the future a little bit to now with the whole JLo and Ben Affleck scandal. People are alleging that one of the reasons that Ben left JLo is because, or they started arguing, I suppose, is because she knows more than she's letting on when it comes to this situation. People are alleging that Ben started hearing more details about what was going on at these freak offs and that maybe JLo knew about it and didn't say anything. And that was something that was like triggering and upsetting to Ben Affleck. But that is purely speculation. I do not personally know at this point. So 1999 just seems to be the year that the House of Cards starts to at least tremble beneath Sean P. Diddy Combs. It's also interesting. There was an artist in the UK that actually was suing Diddy because Diddy was using the name Diddy. And so he was forced to start going by P. Diddy because there is a different Diddy in the UK. And I kind of feel really bad for that Diddy now with all these allegations. And he has to be like, no, 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 this isn't me. But it just goes to show you potentially why Diddy like rebranded so many times and continues to rebrand. And it's all in an attempt to save his own ass, to cover up all of the things he did. And It's all in an effort to reposition himself as a high status person within the entertainment community after some scandal or after something he does doesn't work out. But he still has a ton of power and a ton of control. But anyways, in 1999, a ton of lawsuits are sparked. And I'm going to go through them one by one because it's important to understand the history of a person and their behavior and discover how it might have escalated throughout the years. Because it is my belief that when someone gets away with something or can just pay people off to be quiet and settle every case, they start thinking they can get away with more and more and more and more. And I think that this is the case with Diddy. So in 2003, it was discovered that 
all of the Sean John clothing was being made in Honduras and the working conditions of that space in Honduras were disgusting. And they were using things like raccoon fur. And Diddy was like, oh, I didn't realize they were using real fur. The employees were being treated incredibly terribly and were being forced to do these pregnancy tests, I'm guessing because they didn't want people working if they were pregnant. There was no air conditioning where they were making all of the clothing. There wasn't any clean water. It just sounds like it was a terrible place to work, so much that the National Labor Committee got involved and brought the story to the New York Times. And luckily, because of the exposure of this, the conditions did end up getting changed. They did get air conditioning. They did get fresh water. And the most abusive supervisors were fired. So at least some good came out of that outcome. Because Diddy self-proclaims to be as pro-worker as they come. which feels a little bit laughable at this point, considering he was forcing people to work for him in his freak offs. So the scandal with the UK artist that I mentioned before actually happened in 2005. So Diddy has been using his name since the 90s, but UK Diddy's been using it from the early 90s. So within the UK, Diddy has to go by P. Diddy. And it's like, dude, you clearly change your name six times a year. On the official affidavit, you have like six AKAs. It's like Sean P. Diddy Combs, AKA Diddy, AKA P. Diddy, AKA Puff Daddy, AKA Love. It's just like, can you pick one? Like, how many demons are you running from that you need to rebrand yourself that many times? And then Huff and puff when someone's like, hey, you're using my name. Change it. No, it's just I don't understand why people pick the battles that they do. And in that same year, 2005, he was charged with assault by a Michigan television reporter. But that situation was resolved in Combs's favor later that year. But he is just an inherently bad guy. That one day of anger management really did not work for him because just a couple years later, he had another assault charge on him by a man who claimed that Combs punched him because he was trying to talk to Diddy's girlfriend. And then this case was settled a few months later, and it's like undisclosed how it was settled. A lot of these settlements are like, back door, closed door, not open to the public. And it's frustrating because the public should know if there is this intense of a pattern of information. And I'm sorry, but if someone is this violent this many times, has this many lawsuits against them, at some point, we need to start paying attention when people are trying to alert us to what's going on behind those closed doors. Because as we'll talk about in a minute, There have been a number of celebrities trying to out Diddy for years. Now, if you thought he was done with his violent spree, you would be wrong because in 2015, his own son's football coach alleged that Diddy had assaulted him, but this case was dropped due to lack of evidence. Now, in 2023, a very, very disturbing video was posted to CNN and it depicted Diddy basically attacking his girlfriend at the time, Cassie Ventura. And honestly, I kind of credit her with the bravery of coming forward and actually seeing some justice in regard to this situation because point blank, if you don't open up and share the name of your and let it be public information. There's little that anyone can do about it. And it is my belief that Cassie really empowered other people to finally speak out against what had happened to them. But unfortunately, she is not the first woman to accuse Diddy of SA. Cindy Ruella had been Diddy's personal chef. And in 2017, she filed a lawsuit against him for SA, retaliation, and a number of other things. It seems to me that this guy really likes to be in a power position, and every time he gets involved in a woman, it seems that he tries to exploit their 
either desperation for the financial support that he provides them with to the point where they feel really concerned and scared to say no to him or because he considers them an employee, he considers them like their own object. It seems like time and time again, he needs to exert his power over women to get them to do the deranged things that he wants them to do. And we haven't even scratched the surface of what those allegations actually are. So last November, when this video surfaced, we got more of a glimpse into the type of life that Diddy was really leading behind closed doors. Cassie actually sued Diddy for essay, R-wording her, trafficking. And in the lawsuit, she also alleges that Diddy had basically set Kid Cudi, her new boyfriend's car, on fire. This guy was going to retaliate at all costs. Friends of Cassie's even say that she would be off with Diddy for like days at a time and allegedly they would be doing a lot of explicit substances together. They were partying together and her friends have come out and said that after spending a few days with Diddy, she was like a shell of herself. She was not her. And after hearing about what happened at the freak offs and now learning that perhaps she was subjected to the activities in the freak offs, it's really disturbing and upsetting to know that someone was enduring that behind closed doors and was just so afraid to speak out. And what's even more frustrating is then Diddy comes out apologizing, saying, Oh, I was having a really hard time. My actions are inexcusable. I was dealing with a lot in my life. And like, you should apologize without giving the excuse. Like, if you're going to take accountability and apologize, say, I'm sorry. I'm in therapy. I'm working through my anger. I have only ever had one anger management class. Like, at some point, take accountability for your behavior means you have to start changing that behavior. But it's my belief that even as recently as last week, Diddy thought he was still untouchable. He thought he could use his money to get out of everything. So probably because there was so much that Cassie knew about what was going on behind closed doors, her lawsuit was settled privately the very next day. But it didn't stop other people from speaking out and coming forward. Later that very same month, two people came forward and said that Diddy and a friend were essaying them and recording it back in the early 90s. Recording it. So the very same month, just a couple weeks after Cassie filed her lawsuit, two other people came forward and they accused Diddy of essay and revenge, P-O-R-N. They said that back in 1990 or 1991, Diddy and a friend essayed them while Diddy recorded the encounter. It just goes to show that he's been doing this for a very long time. And it's very concerning to know that he loved throwing these parties. He loved engaging in certain substances. He loved having control over people, particularly women and even some men. And he's probably been doing it for at least three decades. And everyone's been too afraid to actually shout it from the rooftops, save for a few other people like 50 Cent and Eminem who have actually made accusations. But, you know, it's one thing to make an accusation and it's another thing to present solid proof and take legal action against somebody. But it just really makes you wish you'd been listening more, you know? Because throughout the years, Diddy's parties seem to be just like a big joke that he makes with night talk show hosts and Ellen DeGeneres and even Oprah and all these people who knew, oh, Diddy's parties are crazy, but nobody knew just how crazy. Or did they? That's the big question I have in all of this. Who else knew what was going on and how much did they know? Now, just a couple weeks after that lawsuit, in December of 2023, a woman came forward and claimed that Diddy R-worded her back in 2003 when she was only 17 years old. And this, I mean, it just makes you feel like we're now getting a lot of poetic justice. 
But this made Diddy so mad that he took to social media to claim that, like, all these allegations are ridiculous. He's never harmed a woman in that way. He goes by love now. How could he harm anybody? And it's just laughable at this point. So just two months after that, in February of this year, 2024, there is another lawsuit brought against Diddy. And it is by Lil Rod, who's a music producer who had worked with Diddy in the past, who claims that Diddy effectively made him a slave and forced him to sleep with commercial sex workers for Combs's benefit allegedly at these freak-offs. It just seems like every person Diddy interacted with had to engage in some kind of explicit activity with him. And if they didn't, he threatened them with a loss of income, exposure, whatever other collateral he had. He had a grip on everybody. Now, what's really troubling about how our system works in America is... It's really difficult to get a conviction against somebody if you speak out against them anonymously, unless you're a minor. So the woman who came forward about being essayed by Diddy back when she was underage, back in 2003, was forced to disclose her true identity in March of 2024. Now, I personally don't think that that's very fair, so I'm not going to be saying her name here. but. I really wish that we could share allegations and protect ourselves and our mental health and our identities without also being forced to like expose who we are when we're trying to get justice for some of the most disgraceful and traumatic things that can happen to a person. I mean, the people involved in this are traumatized. This is more than just focusing, and it's ironic, I know, because I've been focusing on Diddy for this entire video, but it is so enraging that we don't get to hear right now from the survivors of this and really We need to start trying to sympathize more with the victims who are impacted by this behavior because it's easy to be like, oh, Diddy was doing these freak offs. Ha ha ha. He bought thousands of bottles of lube. What was he going to use that for? It undermines the trauma that all of the victims who are finally feeling strong enough to come out and expose and are finally feeling like they can get justice and are being brave enough to come forward and share the probably embarrassing and highly damaging both physically, mentally, and emotionally, these things that happen to them, and people are just making fun of it on the internet. Diddy's a dangerous person. He's a disgraceful person. He's a deranged and demented individual. And we shouldn't be making so much fun or any fun of these behaviors because it's not funny. And it wasn't funny for the people who endured them. So I really want to think about the survivors and the victims in this case. So on March 25th of this year, all properties that were connected to Combs in Miami, Los Angeles, and New York were raided by FBI. And that is how they found all the evidence of these freak offs. And this is kind of frustrating. (laughs) But on that same day, federal agents found Diddy at the airport and basically like confiscated all of his electronics. But he was on his way to a vacation, and they literally let him leave the country to go on vacation. What? Like, it just, it's like really mind-blowing to me. But a couple days later, Lil Rod actually amends his lawsuit against Diddy and starts dropping names. We've got Cuba Gooding Jr. on there. We've got Prince Harry. We've got these big names being dropped in this lawsuit. And Lil Rod is basically alleging that P. Diddy used these people and their power and their influence to lure people to come to his parties. And whether or not people like Prince Harry were fully aware of what was going on, because I want to make this very clear, Diddy's white parties that like everybody in Hollywood got invited to were a lot different than these secret freak offs or these after parties. And I believe it's my opinion that Diddy was very calculated in doing this. He had these big, huge parties where he invited everybody. He showed them a good time. They were public. He had people taking pictures. It would be in like 
page six of the New York Times or whatever. But that was the cover for all of these freaky, disturbing, illicit, substance-fueled parties he was having behind closed doors, separately most likely from the famed white parties that he was having in the Hamptons. You know what I mean? I think that was like a cover for all the insidious things he was doing behind the scenes at other parties or other events. But something that I keep hearing when I research this more and more is people saying, yeah, they would go to the party, but they wouldn't go into the private room, right? So they might be like partying in like the living room or the area where most of the people were, but then like down the hallway through a door, something might be happening and they didn't really know what was going on. But at the same time, Diddy was also having these like full scale productions with lights and camera and forcing people to have intercourse in front of him and allegedly pleasuring himself while people were doing these things. And then he was trying to get them to go longer and do more. So he was like making them drink and giving them illicit substances and to help them heal quickly from their experiences. He would hook them up to an IV the next morning. And I mean, I'm assuming just be like, well, that was a crazy party. Here you go. Let's get you hydrated. It's like, I can't even imagine waking up and not really fully understanding what had just happened to you until years go by and you kind of like process everything, you know? And what's really unsettling too is it just seems like Diddy had no and has no real boundaries about what's like age appropriate. Because both of his sons have lawsuits against them for essaying people. It's like, were his children being exposed to all of these dangerous behaviors, to all of this depravity on a day-to-day basis? Because if he is fine showing other people's kids at 13, 14 years old all of this weird behavior... One has to assume that he was probably just like, oh, it's an open door policy to my kids. Come on in, boys. Like, watch this freak off with me. It's just it's like like father, like son. It is the conditioned behavior of powerful men letting and raising their sons to grow up thinking that they can get away with everything because they are the offspring of some rich and powerful asshole. It's it. I'm getting a little spicy. I'm getting a little off track. I really wanted to approach this video with like a lot of tact and not share too much opinion. But this stuff just gets me very, very, very riled up, as I'm sure it does you, especially if you're a woman watching this. And I can't even say that because he also men, too. It, it didn't matter who you were. If he saw that you were below him, he was going to exploit that. He was going to exploit that for his own personal gain and pleasure. And in May, yet another woman came forward alleging that Combs had essayed her four times in the early 2000s. And she filed a lawsuit. And it's just like once one door opens, it's like the domino effect. All the other doors open and the light is finally shining bright on all of the disgusting things that this man was doing. The following month in June of 2024, a male inmate in Michigan filed a lawsuit against Combs for S.A., And Combs did not show up to the virtual hearing claiming that like he didn't know about it, which he had to have known unless he didn't have a lawyer. And I'm pretty sure Diddy has a very expensive lawyer. In fact, he has the same lawyer that uh, represented Keith Raniere in the Nexium case, but more on that later or perhaps even in another video because I've been talking for a very long time. But Diddy is supposed to be paying that guy a hundred million dollars because he didn't show up to that virtual hearing because he didn't know or forgot about it. In July of 2024, Audrey English came forward and filed yet another lawsuit against Diddy. Audrey English claims that he was effectively tracking her by coercing her to have intercourse and sexual relations with people at his Labor Day white parties. So, yeah, I think it's safe to say that things were happening behind closed doors. And finally, in September 2024, ex-Sanity Kane member Don Richards filed a lawsuit against Diddy for essaying her. And if you're a Y2K girly like myself, you love Danity Kane. I love Danity Kane. 
And I haven't even gotten into how he treated those girls yet. Apparently, he kept all of the money from the royalties. So since he said like a couple of lines on it and was responsible for producing the music of that band, he felt that he was entitled to all of the income from their girls group. And then he made this publicity stunt a few years ago when people started openly calling him out on it and said, oh, I'm changing things up. I'm giving these girls their royalties. And then they came out and said, yeah, it was like just over $300. And I listen to Danity Kane almost every day. Every time I drive, Damaged is my first song I throw on there. And I hate feeling like I am just lining Diddy's pockets at this point because people aren't listening to Danity Kane thinking about Diddy. We love Danity Kane for Danity Kane, and he exploited those women because apparently and allegedly he doesn't see women as human beings. He sees them as objects that he can make do whatever he wants, and it is infuriating. So on September 16th of this year, Diddy was arrested on trafficking and racketeering. And... There are a lot more allegations, and honestly, the indictment was only 14 pages. If you want to read through it with me, I did go live last week, and we read it here. I will probably be going live more often over the next couple of months to just, like, keep tabs on this case because there is so much more that is going into it right now, and more is uncovered every single day. But what blows my mind is that Diddy is pleading not guilty and even tried to get on bail, promising like, I won't use any electronics and I'll just stay at home. Please let me just give you $50 million to get me out of here. And the judge luckily was like, nope, you are staying in there, dude. Like you are a flight risk. You are a danger to others. You should not be engaging in anyone in your inner circle because everybody allegedly in his inner circle We're helping facilitate all of this disgusting behavior. And on one hand, they are also victims because he was probably holding their finances over their head, their money over their head, their opportunity over their head. And he's very aggressive, very violent. So there's a physical threat there. And he is probably using the Stephen Hassan's bite model to control the behavior, the information. He's probably gaslighting people. He's using thought control, time control, like he's forcing people to stay with him for days at a time to engage in all this behavior. He's forcing an environment on them. He's coercively controlling these people. There's just no way out. This is a common situation we talk about in cults and high control groups. And it feels like Combs is kind of running all of his enterprises to me, very culty, because these are classic tactics that cult leaders use. And I just find it very ironic that the guy that couldn't keep Keith Raniere out of jail is now representing Diddy. It just, it's kind of that poetic justice I'm looking for because personally, I mean, it's enraging, but this guy just doesn't hit the mark for me. I've seen interviews with him and I'm like, you really don't understand cult dynamics or you know, DV dynamics, because that's essentially what's going on here. This is just as much a DV case as it is a trafficking case, racketeering case, a freak off case. This is an abusive person who needs to stay behind bars. And we have to hold these powerful people accountable for their behavior. What's really interesting in the aftermath of all of this over the last week or so is People not only reminding us that, yeah, others have been talking about this for a very long time. I mean, I remember the beginning of this year, my fiance talking about a cat interview where he literally says that this year, all of these powerful people are going to be exposed. And he even claims that he was invited to Diddy parties and Diddy even offered him $50 million to take his rear end's virginity and Kat refused and said no and also warned the audience, if Diddy invites you to a party, do not go. We have 50 Cent making the same claims. We have Eminem writing music about it. There are people who have been trying to alert more people in the industry to the behavior that's been going on behind closed doors. 
So it'll be very interesting to see if anyone else comes out. Like, is Prince Harry going to make a statement? <laughs> like, who is going to come out on behalf of these victims? Because when you sit back and you analyze it and you think, OK, we need more ri- witnesses. We need people to come out and openly say, yes, I saw this happen. But it implicates themselves in that behavior and it implicates them in their relationship and their proximity to Diddy. If you look at Ashton Kutcher, for example, he and Diddy did punked together. They were really good friends. Just a few years ago, Ashton was being very like gatekeepy about some of the things that Diddy does on a public forum and then expects us all to pretend that Yeah, he probably didn't know what was going on behind closed doors because from what it sounds like, these freak offs were far reaching. And if you don't know exactly what a freak off was, I guess this is the time to share that as I begin to conclude this video. These were Diddy house parties, essentially. They were drug fueled, alcohol fueled, and they were productions. Basically, he would have members of his staff or even himself, scope out participants to try to get them to come over to his house and partake in this behavior. He called it a freak-off because he basically turned it into a full-scale production with uh, lights, cameras, and in doing this and capturing everything on tape, he's able to hold collateral over the people and keep them from speaking out. So there's this massive power dynamic at play here where if you're employed by Diddy, it's in your best interest to do what he says. If you're an aspiring musician or otherwise aspiring artist, it's in your best interest to get close to Diddy, network, and do some of these creepy things that he's asking you to do. You have one of the most powerful people in the world wanting something from you. And from what we've learned in reading the affidavit is It was a slow burn, it seemed, for a lot of these individuals. There was a courting aspect to it where people didn't necessarily know what they were getting invited to when they accepted the invitation. That's what coercive control does. He made things sound like they were different than they truly were. And he had plans to make it escalate based off of some of the findings when the FBI raided his homes, like all of the lube and all of that. It's very, very clear that he had big plans for the future. Another piece of information that I learned the day that I filmed this is there was a man who was arrested in 2018 for going into the lobby of a Trump hotel, I believe in Miami, and started basically violently attacking the place with a weapon, for lack of a better way to keep this YouTube friendly. And this man, Back in 2018, instead of trying to defend himself, he just started offering up information about Diddy. He claimed that he was one of Diddy's slaves. I mean, this is all on camera. This is a police interrogation from 2018. I mean, so this guy has the opportunity to be a key witness in this case. So there is a lot that is going to continue to unfold within this case. So I will try my best to keep you guys updated. But in the meantime, I implore you, please do not get seduced by the bright lights and the money. There's a better way to be successful in the entertainment industry, and it will never involve you exploiting yourself, especially now post Me Too, where we're at in society and all of the social and union programming that we have that is made to protect performers. Just please be careful out there and know that if something seems fishy, it really probably is. And just never go anywhere alone, especially if I was going to say, don't go anywhere a man has ever invited you. (laughs) But I just want to say thank you guys for your support. Let me know if you liked this video, you want more videos like this, and you want more updates about this situation. And Let me know what you think about Diddy's like rise to fame and power. What do you think? Do you think that he was like a deprived kid who took every opportunity he could to gain power so he could 
enact some of his more perverted desires? Or do you think that his behavior is a symptom of people having too much fame and money? And when you have access to everything, nothing is satisfying anymore. So you have to keep going to darker, darker, darker places to get that satisfaction. I'm really curious to know what you guys think about all of that. Well, anyways, I want to say thank you all for your support. I hope you have a wonderful, wonderful rest of your day. And please stay safe out there. Ask questions and always stay skeptical. Until next time. Bye.